Good morning everybody and I welcome you to this service of worship in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, you overwhelm us. Your might and your majesty are beyond anything we can imagine or create. Your glory is so great, it, is, it simply cannot be contained. Not even the vast expanse of time and space is sufficient to encompass your glory. And yet, more wonderful still, you're here. You have come to receive our worship. You have come to make your home even in our poor lives. And so we have come to receive all that you are able to give, all that you want to give. We have come to receive your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. This morning John is not here um, to share the intimations with you, so he's asked me to do it. And the first one is to announce that our annual general meeting of the church will be held here in the church on Wednesday the 14th of April at 7pm. It will be to receive the financial accounts and to receive the reports of the church. The second point is to pray for a vet who's still going through chemotherapy. She had some last Tuesday. Please keep her and all that you know in your prayers. Our verse for the week comes from Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 7 and 8. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. May God bless to us this reading from his holy word and in his name be your honour, glory and praise. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Siridun to do both the prayer of intercession and our scripture reading. Thanks, sir. Good morning, everybody. Can we bow our heads in prayer? Father, we pray for the whole church which you called into being through your Son. We are aware that it was always your intention that your church should be a blessing to all people everywhere. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, your church may be daily renewed and empowered for the task for which you gave it life. We pray, Father, that we and all our fellow Christians may be ready for any sacrifice, any action, any declaration that will clearly demonstrate faith, hope and love to our neighbour, our family and our friends, and to those with whom we work and those we meet on the journey of life each day. We pray for Christians who have trusted you and for whom obedience has brought sorrow and loss, for those who, as an act of discipleship, have felt led to involvement in feeding the hungry, seeking the lost, healing the broken, or enabling the defeated. We pray for those who, because they know God has made them his special people, do all that they can to make others special too. For those who care for the sick and the dying, for those who care for others, whose lives and emotions are in need of health and healing. Lord, we bring to you the situation of the world as this COVID pandemic has devastated the world. Lord, we pray for the third wave that is engulfing the Northern Hemisphere at the, at the moment. So many people are ill, in hospital and are dying. We bring them before you, Lord, 
and we bring those who have lost their loved ones, those who are living with the aftermath of COVID. And Lord, we just ask for your presence with them. We pray for our own country as we've just been through the Easter holidays and we just pray that the third wave may be curbed. We pray that people will keep their distance, keep the protocols and be aware that this little virus can cause so much devastation. So Lord, we commit our country into your hands at this moment through this pandemic. We pray for those whose faith has lost meaning, whose worship is all ritual and empty words, for those who are no longer aware of God's presence, his power or his love, for those who see only the hurt and the pain and the darkness of life. We ask that they may see the joy and the goodness and the light of Christ in the lives of his people. We pray for those who know who have been reduced to despair, for those whose joy has been crushed by the indifference of others, for those who have suffered great grief, who are left numb by the sorrow and loss, for those still overwhelmed by the separation of death that death brings from someone they loved and who loved them. We pray for ourselves in the face of all of life's uncertainties, sorrows and hurts, disappointments and failures, we ask that the assurance of Christ's presence, power and love may give us strength, hope and faith. We ask this prayer in the name of Christ our Saviour and our Lord. Amen. Our reading, our scripture reading this morning is taken from John chapter 20 verses 1 to 16. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up it by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw, and he believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking the gardener, it was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to my Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them, 
that he had said these things to her. May God bless to us the reading of his word. Amen. Thanks, Rodman. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. First of all, I'd just like to say, please excuse the scratchy voice. I don't know why, but it's uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, rough at the back there. So uh, if it comes across a bit different, please be, be with me. Let's set the scene. Um, a few days before, that is on the Friday, Jesus had died on the cross. And after death, his body was taken down, hurriedly prepared for burial and laid in a garden tomb. A large stone was rolled in front of the tomb's entrance and it was sealed. Uh, issued by the Roman uh, procreator, uh, procreator Pontius Pilate, it was, the seal was placed over the stone, barring anyone from opening the tomb. Now, it's early Sunday morning, and according to an examination of the Gospels, the four Gospels, a group of about four or five women approached the tomb where Jesus had been laid. There hadn't been sufficient time after the crucifixion to prepare his body for burial properly. Uh, properly. And, and that is what they were going there to do this Sunday morning. And as they were getting closer to the tomb, it suddenly occurred to them, and it's written in Mark 16, chapter 3, who's going to roll the stone away from the door of the cave? But in spite of the, that problem, they kept on going. When they got to the tomb, they found a scene that they didn't expect. They found the stone rolled away from the entrance of the tomb, Matthew 28, verse 2. They found the soldiers who were guarding the tomb lying on the ground, Matthew uh, 28, verse 4. They found the body of Jesus gone, that's in all of the Gospels, but Mark, Luke 24, verse 3. Suddenly two angels appeared and proclaimed to them that Jesus had risen. The angels told the women to go and tell his disciples, and so that's what they did. Luke chapter 24, verses 4 to 6. But the men didn't believe them. It sounded a load of rubbish. Luke chapter 24, verse 11. Mary Magdalene went to uh, Peter and John, and they start running for the tomb to see for themselves. They are followed by Mary Magdalene. The tomb was empty. No one doubted that part of the woman's story, but what they needed to find out for themselves was why it was empty and what it all meant. Funnily enough, that's the same thing that everyone, everyone must decide for themselves when they come to the issue of the risen Lord Jesus. Sure, the body's gone, but why? Why? Why was the tomb empty? And, and what does it mean? What does it mean to you and me? We all agree, as I say, on the empty tomb, but we have to come to some kind of belief. We either reject it or accept it. What has happened that day? And the question of how you respond to that empty tomb is going to affect the rest of your life. Let's look mostly at how John and Peter reacted to that empty tomb. The first to arrive is John. Uh, he calls himself the beloved disciple. I love that title. Imagine, John felt that he was beloved more than anybody else by Jesus himself. And he showed it as he ran towards the tomb with all his might and uh, uh, ran as fast as he possibly could. Of all the disciples of Jesus, possibly at the end he had been the most faithful of them all. He had been in the courtyard following Jesus when he was interrogated and sentenced to death. John was there. He had been at the foot of the cross 
when it doesn't seem like any other disciples was there, uh, while Jesus was dying. And he willingly offered to take in Jesus' mother, Mary, take her home and to care for her for the rest of his life. I think he was either so excited that Jesus might actually be alive or so angry uh, that he wanted to rip somebody's head off uh, that, he went, that he got to the tomb so quickly. He, something drove him, but he didn't go into the tomb. He, he looked inside and he saw some of what Mary had said, but he stayed outside. Uh, maybe he stayed outside because he was afraid, not knowing what to expect. If Mary was wrong and Jesus' body had been moved to another part of the cave, what, what if that? And he was still there. Maybe he didn't want to see Jesus all mangled up, you know, from the torture, the blood seeping through the grave cloths that had been wrapping him. Maybe he was scared of Roman authority. Um, the seal had been broken, the tombstone had been rolled away. What if once he and Peter were inside and the guards suddenly appeared? Uh, it, it could be an elaborate, an elaborate trap by the Jewish authorities and the Roman officials to lure the disciples there and then arrest them and say that they caught them trying to steal the body of Jesus and make it look like Jesus had risen from the dead as he predicted he would. Then after a few seconds Peter arrives at the tomb. Big brash Peter runs right in without the slightest hesitation. And he saw everything just as Mary described it. He also noticed that the linen that covered Jesus' body was all neatly lying in place, but empty. Then John follows Peter inside. Both saw all the evidence, but, and I want to emphasize this, but they responded differently. They responded differently. We're told by John that he saw and believed. Now, the empty grave and the way the clothes were lying there was enough to convince him that what the women had said was true. It simply says in his gospel, he believed. He believed. Jesus really had been risen from the dead. He didn't see uh, he didn't need to see that Jesus, to see Jesus, to know that he was alive, that something special had happened, that a miracle had happened. He remembered Jesus' prophecies about his coming death and resurrection, and now here was the empty tomb, and that was enough. He believed. And I'm sure there are many people like John listening today. In fact, most of us are like John. We believe because there is an empty tomb and because there is the testimony of those Christians. It is the, for John, it was the testimony of the women. For us, it's the testimony of other Christians through the centuries, all witnessing to the fact that Jesus, the risen Christ, has touched their lives. We don't need to see to believe. We join with John in being the ones of whom Jesus spoke only a few verses later when Jesus confronts Thomas. And Jesus says to Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. We are the blessed ones. John reacted to an empty tomb and believed. So do we. Then there was Peter. Peter was a little slower than John arriving at the tomb. More likely it's because Peter was older. Uh, it slows you down, doesn't it, age? Or maybe it was because he was too afraid of what he might find. I don't think Peter was afraid of soldiers. In fact, he was the one who drew out a little sword that he was carrying uh, on the night of the betrayal and cut off somebody's ear when they came to arrest Jesus. Peter wanted to see Jesus, but I think there was a part of him that dreaded seeing Jesus, dreaded the idea of meeting with him face to face. 
The last time he had looked into the eyes of Jesus, he had betrayed him in the courtyard. He denied him. If Peter saw Jesus, he knew he was going to have to be confronted by that sin and the guilt of the past. I'm not sure he wanted to do that, and so he hung back. Peter's, was vis Peter's vision of Jesus and his resurrection was clouded by the pain that he felt because of his past. He wanted Jesus to be alive, but he didn't know how he was going to face him now that he, if he was alive. Maybe there are people like that listening today. You want to believe, but there's just too much history. You've got too much baggage from the past, maybe too much pain. Let me tell you something. Jesus can and does forgive and he does heal. But still, Peter still went into the tomb and he examined the evidence for himself. He saw the linen that had wrapped Jesus' body and that piece of cloth that was neatly folded and put off to the side. It was enough, I want to say this, it was enough to prove that something here had happened. But it wasn't enough proof to show that Jesus was alive. Another account of this in the Gospel of Luke uh, says that Peter was wondering to himself what had happened. And that's Luke 24, verse 12. Wondered to himself what had happened. There was doubt there, there was scepticism. He just needed more evidence. Then I think Peter did one of the most foolish things of his life. He left. He went away. He walked away. So, with something as important as this, he left without even coming to a conclusion about what had happened. If Peter had only hung around just a little bit longer, he would have experienced the same miracle that Mary did. Too many people don't hang around long enough for the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus to be placed in their heart, faith in Jesus, because of the simple reason that they don't hang around enough. They don't spend enough time around God's people who are sure of his resurrection. They come to church maybe once and twice and then they walk out of the door before the miracle of a changed life happens and they miss it. They don't read God's word so they have no understanding of its power to transform lives. They, uh, they don't spend enough time in prayer so they can't be touched by the Spirit of God. They aren't present with other Christians to see the miracle of God's changing power. Peter walked away from that empty tomb with his heart still broken, doubt still in his mind, as so many people who are seeking do. They do exactly the same. If only been like Mary Magdalene. When Peter and John had left, she met the risen Jesus. Jesus meant so much to Mary. He had released her from demonic possession. He had given her peace that she had never known before. She had found forgiveness. Jesus had released her from her sin. He had given her someone to believe in. He had given her a purpose and a direction for her life. She believed all, uh, she believed all that was gone in the, in the, when Jesus was taken, and so she starts to cry. Mary had lost that which was most valuable to her, more valuable than anything else. She had lost Jesus. And then the miracle happens. Mary puts it this way. I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. And that's John 20, verse 18. That should have been Peter's cry. I have seen the Lord, but he missed it. 
He missed it. He walked away. Everyone watching this video is like those witnesses to that empty tomb. Every one of us. All of us know that something special happened back then. That was the cause. The fact is the church today. All of us had the same opportunity to examine the same evidence and yet there will be different reactions. Many of us will be like John. You see the empty tomb, you believe. Jesus says that we are the blessed. And we are. Continue to rejoice that Jesus is alive, that his Holy Spirit is with you. It means that you and I will live with him in eternity. That is his promise. That is his assurance. The assurance of our faith. The assurance of the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. And that is our resurrection and eternal life. But some of us listening are like Peter. We see the empty tomb and we don't know what to believe. There's something going on in our, our mind and in our heart, but we don't know what. Each one knows that there is something special about Jesus. We know it. But there's just something holding us back, that doubt, that scepticism. You might say, I don't quite understand all this religious stuff. I can see there is something there, something that is good, something that I like, but I'm not sure that I want to commit myself wholeheartedly to it. There's only one way you will ever understand, and that is stick around. Stick around. Don't give up. Don't leave. Don't wait until you see just, sorry, just don't leave. Stick around till you see um, the miracle of your life. A changed life. Stay at the foot of the cross in prayer. Stay at the empty tomb. Don't become cynical. Don't become sceptical. Don't sneer. And then, I promise you, then like Peter, John and Mary... Something special will happen. You will meet with the living, risen Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, our Father, for those who are blessed because they know Jesus, can strengthen them, Lord. Strengthen them in their faith. Help them proud to be Christians to carry the name of Christ and for those who doubt let them find you Lord let them find you let them read the scriptures let them pray let them meet with other Christians until that change happens you met with Peter you met with him we're told separately and then on the beach And from then on, Peter, John and Mary never doubted you, Lord. They went to their graves, to their deaths, glorifying your holy name and proclaiming Jesus Christ has risen. And we all proclaim with them, he has risen indeed. And so, Heavenly Father, Allow us to go out in peace, to find and to live the risen Christ. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you now and will be with you forever. Amen.